All right. Well, everybody, welcome to our last installment together, except for next week when the bishop comes and tells you different of everything that I've taught you the last three weeks. Hopefully not. But to start our class today on the end, you know, we talked a lot about this, this issue of time last week. And in particular, how our minds can't wrap around this existence of being outside of temporal time. And if you remember back to the very first class, I had everyone pause for a couple seconds, and we were trying to wrap our head around that word eternity. Remember, we took like five seconds, and we shut our eyes, and we tried to wrap our head around this idea of what eternity is, that reality that there's always going to be something next. There's always going to be an existence to use temporal terms, there's always going to be a tomorrow, right? We use that, that word. So in keeping on this theme of eternity, I thought it would, beginning, it would be appropriate to begin our class on the end with the last several paragraphs of the Chronicles of Narnia series. So C.S. Lewis, at the very end of the book, uses some incredibly beautiful imagery to describe what he says is eternity for us. So at the end of the book... All of the kings and queens of Narnia are speaking to Aslan about the age that was to come. And then, does everybody have this in their books? It starts on, what page does it start on? Nine? Yes, page nine. And it says, And as he, so this is Aslan, As Aslan spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. And now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has ever read, which goes on forever, in which each chapter is better than the one before it. What a beautiful description of eternity and our existence with God. I was reading um, one of my morning routines when I get here uh, as I go through a cathisma reading. It doesn't have to be particularly the one that's assigned for the day, but just a cathisma reading, which is reading of psalms. And I read through a specific set of psalms and then some prayers that are associated with those psalms. And I heard this one uh, just this past week, and I forgot to write down what number it was, but maybe you'll know. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. So depart, despite our earthly lives being so short, our Lord's compassion, His love for us is eternal which makes the ending of our earthly lives, just like C.S. Lewis described it, truly only the beginning. So my hope for this evening, I'm going to do my best, to try to offer some insight into the end times and specifically giving you an introduction to the book of Revelation before wrapping up on this very confusing but hopefully enlightening topic for you of this Orthodox Christian understanding of heaven and hell, which is very, very different from a Western understanding of heaven and hell. And then this should all set us up nicely for next week when we have Bishop Alexander coming, uh, who's going to be speaking to us about the last judgment. So that's kind of where we're going to go with this. And we'll see where it takes us. Oop. All right, some background on the book of Revelation. So, you know, it's not uncommon nowadays to hear in our country various preachers, televangelists, somebody mentioned televangelists, and all kinds of people talking about the end of the world the end of all life. And anybody who's ever been to a big city or has driven up Route 23 has probably seen billboards or something like that, something to the effect of the end is near, repent, you know, or, or they have like the one, I don't know who puts it out, it's the truth.com or whatever that says, you know, heaven, and it has the, the nice, nice bright thing, or hell, and it has the fire, and then you have to call the number and donate $20 to decide where you're going to go. <laughs> So we have all of these different themes and things out there that talk about the end being near. Or maybe sometimes, you know, we even have 
we'll be on Facebook or something like that, and we'll, we'll see an article that points to the fact that, well, the harvest moon that we just had here in October, where the moon was real red, and that coupled with the fires that are going on in California and the earthquakes, this is all the opening of the sixth seal of St. John's Revelation. Like, we have all these weird uh, guesses into the, the images that are seen in that book. But trying to uncover the mysteries of the apocalypse, we have to understand that this is not some kind of recent phenomena that's brought in by, by mainstream Protestant sects. I think over the course of the New Testament history of humanity, men have tried to decipher the significance and meaning of that revelation of the end times that St. John received on the island of Patmos. And the book of Revelation has kind of become... It's probably become one of the most popular books of the New Testament and Holy Scripture, especially amongst evangelical Christians. Can we all agree with that? I mean, it's one of the most popular books that there is. And there are some churches that exist where this book is actually studied more than the four Gospels. It's studied more than the epistles. It's studied more than the Old Testament, with the exception of maybe Daniel, which has a lot of prophecy about what? The end times, times right? But this intense study of these mysteries of Revelation, this is what has led to a host of wild misinterpretations that have come about throughout the centuries. And I'm not just talking about rapture theology, which we'll get into briefly in this class. In the second and third centuries, there were all kinds of false teachings in Revelation that took place. Does anybody know the main one, second and third century? No. You may have heard the term chiliasm. The heresy of the church that speaks about that thousand-year reign of Christ. You know how we hear about all these, this talk about the thousand-year reign of Christ in modern day. This was all a heresy that was debunked by the church 1,800 years ago, <laughs> but it's just now being reborn into something different. So we'll talk a little bit about those, but all of these different misinterpretations and, and, and mistakes that were led uh, into really diving in and studying heavily the book of Revelation, this is one of the reasons, here's your fact of the day. The book of Revelation was not included in the Bible until the 4th century, 250 years after it was written. And wasn't that the, the Roman church really pushed that for that? There was no Roman church back in the 4th century. It was all the church. Or the church that's on the western side of the empire. I don't know the history of that. I just know that it was very high. I don't know who, who exactly... Got for it, had for it to go into the canon of Scripture, but I mean, I just know that it took a long time for it to get into, and we could understand why, right? We'll talk about why here in the next slide, actually. But how, like the details of how it made its way in, I'm not 100% sure on that one. We could find out, though. All right, here's a big question. When will you hear a reader in the church say, you know how we read Old Testament readings all the time in the church at Vespers, per sanctified liturgy, uh, we hear on Sunday the epistles and we hear the gospels on Sunday. When will you hear throughout the entire liturgical year the readers say the reading is from the revelation of St. John? What? Never. 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 The book, I'll tell you, the book of Revelation to this day is the only canonical book of the New Testament that is not publicly read in the services of the Orthodox Church. Does anybody want to know why or guess why? Who can guess? Cindy. That is a that is a one of the reasons. Yes, that's a really. It wasn't the reason I was looking for, but that was a very. That's a that's a good answer. Anybody else want to guess why? It's not important. It's not important. That's also another good answer, but not the one I'm looking for. This is because they felt that that was for that time, not for us. So you think it's not for our time? It was for the uh, the all the, the, those things that were happening. Uh, mm. Then. <laughs> Uh, this will be, I'll just give you the easy answer. It's because it's hard to interpret, oh, okay. right? In the, in the divine liturgy, you notice that what happens right after the gospel and the epistle are read? What usually happens in the divine liturgy? The homily, right? The priest or the bishop will come out and they'll give a homily based on what was read. This is why when the deacon reads the gospel, which way does he face? The priest. He's out in the center of the church giving the message, the scripture reading to the priest so that the priest could turn around and interpret it and speak to it about how it can affect our spiritual lives to the people or to the bishop doing, the, doing it to the people. So one of the reasons that we don't hear about the book of Revelation and the worship services is because it is very difficult to give a very quick 
and easy interpretation of the book of Revelation. And often, if you were to do that, it would also lead to what happened in the centuries of the church, for people to misunderstand certain things that are being said, all of these different symbols and all of these different meanings. And this is actually, I, I, I was telling Adam, and I told a couple of you on Sunday, I have had so much trepidation about this particular course on Revelation. Because growing up Orthodox, there wasn't much emphasis placed on the revelation of St. John, right? We never heard it in the services. It was never preached upon because we never heard it in the services. Do we believe that it is an important part of Scripture, divinely inspired? Absolutely. Yes. Was it placed in the canon of Scripture for our spiritual edification? Yes. Absolutely we believe that. But why do you think that there isn't such a large emphasis placed on it as opposed to what we see in the modern day Christian confessions? What did you say? What was your answer? It doesn't matter. Because understanding the details of what is to come is not part of what it means to be a Christian. It offers us no spiritual benefit whatsoever to believe that President Trump moving the capital of Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem is going to bring about the coming of the new age. And by the way, there were lobbyists in Washington that pushed for that just for this purpose. They wanted to see the beginning of the apocalypse, but I digress. I'm not going to get into a political <laughs> um, thing in here. But I did want to bring that up. Yes? Well, based upon your argument that Revelation is very difficult to understand, mm -hmm. but it's still in Scripture, Yes. Then why is the book, The Shepherds of Hermes in Scripture, also even though it's very difficult to understand? What is the content of the Shepherd? So just as a background for this, and we could do another class on how books made it into the, to the Bible, but there had to be three criteria for a book to be made into the Bible. Does anybody, to, a book to make it into the canon of Scripture. Does anybody know what those three criteria were? It talks about Christ. Has to talk about Christ. It has to talk about his crucifixion. Nope. Nope. Has to be widely, huh? like, univer like widely read within the has to be within the worship services of the church. Apostolic authorship. Or or or, or believed to be read and what? Apostolic. apostolic origin. I believe that the Shepherd of Hermas didn't make it in because it, they couldn't prove apostolic origin, that it came from, from that era, so to speak. <coughs> I believe that's why the Shepherd of Hermas didn't make Is that it. That's why the book was still popular during that time. Well, there's another book that's popular that's not in Scripture that we get all of our. Where do we get all of our our feast days on Mary? Do anybody know? Proto the Proto Evangelion of James. Why isn't the Proto Evangelion of James in the Bible? Because it, it wasn't about Christ, <laughs> right? It had apostolic origin, St. James. It made all those other criteria, but it wasn't about Christ. There's a, there's a whole class that could go into books about the Bible, and maybe I'll do that. Maybe that'll be an interesting, what the Orthodox Church teaches about Scripture and the, the, the development of the canon, because there's some interesting history there, and we'll, we'll have to get into that. The history channel is future today, though. Huh? The History Channel features too. Well, you don't believe everything you read on the History Channel. There's also a show on there called Ancient Aliens, right? <laughs> right? So if understanding the details of the end times wasn't necessary, why did the church ultimately decide to put the revelation of St. John into the New Testament canon? Well, we have to look at the... Oh, hold on. You guys answered all of these questions. See, you were really good. Okay. Why was it put into the New Testament canon? You have to remember that during the time that this book was written, and for the first couple centuries of the church until it was included in the canon of scriptures, Christians were convinced that the second coming was right around the corner. Right? Right today? Some are, yes. But the, throughout the first century of the church, what also was happening? A lot of persecutions, right? The likes of which we would find hard to believe here in our own modern day free country so to speak. So when the early Christians read the book of Revelation, they weren't looking at it like, you know, this represents this, and this represents this, and this is a roadmap to the end of the world. This isn't what they were reading whenever they were reading the book of Revelation. It served as an inspiration for them. Why would the book of Revelation serve as an inspiration for them to remain steadfast in their faith? What happens at the end of the book of Revelation to all those people that remain steadfast? You win. You win. Right, thank you. That's perfect. We win. So this was an inspirational book to say, hey, regardless of all the stuff that is going on in your life, all of your friends that are being marched off and their heads sliced off and burned at the stake, remain steadfast in your faith, regardless of the obstacles that you're facing. When you read Revelation with that in mind, 
you can't help but see how Christians would become inspired to maintain their faith even through the eyes of difficulty. And that just doesn't apply for them at that time. This type of encouragement is also really meant for us when we read the book of Revelation. We can also gain some type of consolation to strengthen us for the battles that we might not be facing right now, but we will be facing maybe in our lifetimes of the things that are going to be happening here. We talked last week about how the, the demons like to prey on those that they can use. And I would argue right now that God knows, and God knows this more than I could say, but I would argue right now that probably the spiritual and moral state of our country is probably at an all-time low, right? Since its founding. It's probably at an all-time low. But we could take comfort when we read books like Revelation in the fact that regardless of what persecution of Christians is coming, and it is coming, it'll be subtle. It already has started to be a little bit subtle. It'll ramp up. It'll ramp up. But we could take comfort in knowing that regardless of what happens, we've seen in Revelation and we see throughout church history that what? We always win. win. The church always triumphs and it always thrives during times of persecution. We just have to look at, at Soviet Russia, right? And what's happening right now. What's going on in Russia? I've always wanted to ask you that. Well, I mean... Now they have a, a resurgence of Christianity going on in the Slavic lands. After going 100 years, or however long, the, how long was the Soviet Union? 80 years? 80 years worth of, of persecution and millions of Christians getting slaughtered, you know, because it was an atheistic state. So that's, that's a, whole other, a whole other class that I don't have time to get into, but that's a, that's a great question. But look what's happened. They're a prime example for us, though. Look what's happened to them since that time. They have, I think they're making, there was some, I saw a statistic uh, and they're building like, like eight churches a week in that country. A week. They have a shortage of priests. And it's not for the amount of, of lack of, of trying to get seminarians to go there. I mean, it's really, a, 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 it's really thriving over in Russia. All right. One of the many wonderful things we've talked about a couple times about Orthodox theology is that the church doesn't try to develop find things that are mysteries. Rather than trying to define what something is, there's a technique in a, of the Holy Fathers and Mothers that they use, and they try to describe what something is not. Does anybody know what this type of theology is called? This is your Scrabble word of the day. Negative, Negative theology. What's the, what's the fun? Apophatic. Apophatic theology. And we use this kind of theology a lot whenever we're trying to describe or use details that describe God. We use this in the Anapha prayers, right? We don't describe what God is, but we describe what God is not. So when Father Matthew, or when, when we read the prayers out loud, we'll read at the Anapha that God is ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible, ever existing and eternally the same. Because if we said that he was um, visible, conceivable, comprehensible, then he wouldn't be God, right? So we use negative terms to describe what God is not, in order to try and understand what a little bit better of an idea about what he is. And I, this is how I want to approach our studies this evening. All right. So the apophatic approach is how I want to approach Revelation because it'll help us not to fall into errors and various rabbit holes that might come from this topic. So let's talk about two misconceptions about the book of Revelation. The first one, people will say that the book of Revelation, modern day Scripture scholars might say that the book of Revelation is a roadmap to uncover when the second coming of Christ will occur. Is this an orthodox belief? No. no. In preparing for this course, I actually wanted to get a taste of this thinking because it was very foreign to me. Uh, I wanted to get a taste of what it was like for people that study and try to decode the end times. And so has anybody seen those signs on the side of the, the highway and there's a lot of billboards and then they have, they're, they're in people's yards that has like a, a Jesus that's like, he looks psychedelic and there's like a, the new age in front of him and it says Jesus on prophecy series. Have we seen commercials for these things? And they, they sent, they did a massive mail, mailing campaign and they sent it to people's houses. You probably threw it away. Through a specific church? It's, yeah, it was through... No, isn't there's what they're all over the place. It was put on by the Seventh Day Adventists, right? And I wanted to do some comparative theology, so I went with Subdeacon Andrew Duran to one of their classes, to one of their very first classes. And unfortunately, it wasn't on the Book of Revelation, which I was bummed about, but it was on the prophecy of Daniel. And I wanted to get 
an idea of their type of thinking. And the pastor spoke very eloquently, and it was actually a very beautifully and well done presentation. And he was speaking about, the, in particular, the dream that Daniel interpreted, uh, 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 uncovered and interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar at the beginning of the book of Daniel. Do we remember this dream? Who's read the book of Daniel in here? So, or at least have an idea. So this dream, he's, the, 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 the thing that Daniel is prophesying in this dream is he's prophesying all of the kingdoms that are going to come after Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon falls, right? And so he, has, he, he talks about the, 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 the idol with the different layers. I'm trying to, trying to rack my brain. But he, the prophecies that he comes up with, we can kind of match up through history, and he was correct. So he talked about the fall of Nebuchadnezzar's, and the, and Nebuchadnezzar's empire and the rise of the Persians. And then he talks about the fall of the Persians and the rise of Alexander the Great in 330 BC. And he's using images to describe these various empires. And then he talks about the rise of the Roman Empire. And all of these prophecies that Daniel ta talked about, and this pastor highlighted very well, he said, this is exactly what these things mean, and this is where they've happened in history. And then he got to the kingdom that hasn't happened yet, and he started to speculate. And he said, well, this last kingdom that has yet to fall, which is going to usher in the next end times, is actually the European Union. And he started to use various scripture and historical coincidences and scripture verses to try and show that it was the European Union which is going to be the last empire to fall. And then that would usher in the rapture and our Lord will come again and, and say enough. And then here's my favorite line of the whole thing. I've used this a couple times. I, he, he said this though and I, I loved it. He says, brothers and sisters, we are now at the toenails of history. What does that mean? We're at the... We're at the end of history. We're, we're, it's, at, it's at the bottom. We're at the, the toenails of history, and the end is coming. We have to be very careful, very, very careful as Orthodox Christians when trying to use Scripture for an, a means to uncover these mysteries of God. In fact, Christ very clearly warns against this type of teaching in the book of Matthew, doesn't he, about justifying or trying to figure out a date. He says, of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but who? Who knows? Father My Father only. So as soon as you start to guess and say, well, this is the European Union, so we must be, let's see, seven and a half years away from, from the coming in. As soon as you posit that, then you've already done what Christ says you shouldn't be doing, Right? Yeah, 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 but... You know, no, there's no but. There's no but. I just want to explain that, you know, how the politics gets around that. How would they get around that? Um, the most famous prophet speaker that I know is Dan Limpy. And he got... He was in 19... You know, 2012, when everybody said the wars were here because of the computer virus thing. He said, well, you know that the mind said that war was going to end in 1912. 2012, so... I, that's when Christ is going to come back because the mind says so. What word pagan have anything to do with Christianity? That, I don't know. But that's yeah, but that still doesn't answer and how they could justify. Books on that. But, how, well, but how can they, that still doesn't justify how they could look past that verse of Scripture by our Lord that says nobody knows. Yeah. So who are you? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, well, but that's the point. That's the point. <laughs> Misconception number two. Tell me if this is true. Scripture describes in detail exactly how the end of the world will occur. Ha. With all of these symbols that are used in the descriptions of the end time, especially in the book of Revelation, we have to be very careful in trying to ascertain what these images are referring to. So throughout the centuries, there have been thousands and thousands of interpretations of these symbols and details about the second coming. There was a writer who said this quote, maybe somebody could place it for me. I tried to look and I couldn't find it on the internet. But there was a famous writer and he once said, the only scarier thing than the book of Revelations are the interpretations that have come from it. Right? <laughs> who said that? Does anybody remember Does anybody hearing that quote before? No. I thought it was a famous quote. Maybe it wasn't, but it's a really good one. <laughs> When you study the various thoughts and interpretations of the end times, you will hear all kinds of schools of thought. You'll hear things about the rapture, the thousand-year reign of Christ, pre-tribulation, post-tribulation. I'm still trying to figure all the pan-tribulation. I'm still trying to figure all these things out. Okay, oh, was it? Okay. So, I don't even know. But every, Oh, that's right. You told me that one. You know, growing up as an Orthodox Christian, all of these schools of thought that I've heard over the last... 
five, six years of the rapture and these things like that, I've had, I had no concept of until I turned on Netflix and saw Nicolas Cage's Left Behind and all these people disappeared off the plane. I'm like, wait, what? You know, I thought this was fiction. And then I started figuring out, then they started quoting scripture verses. And I'm like, oh, this is like a real thing, right? <laughs> people really believe this stuff. Oh, you guys so lucky. Uh, well, <laughs> so in order to try and figure out those things, that for, for, for in order for us to, for thus, I'm looking at Rebecca, who's, who's shaking her head with me because she's in the same boat. For those of us that did not grow up with this type of, Theology. I just want to give you a taste of this. I got this directly from the internet, so who knows how reliable this is. Don't ask me what camp this came from, but here is, is one, one camp's interpretation of end times logic. You ready? I'm going to go real quickly through this. There's going to be a moment in history where millions of people will disappear, their glow, clothes will fall to the ground, and the earth will go through a major crisis for seven years where everybody is wondering, where are the babies? All of the babies just disappeared. And during that time, there's going to be an antichrist that's going to be revealed. The battle of Armageddon will take place. Jesus will come and set up a thousand-year kingdom. The devil will get loosed on folks that were born during that thousand years. We're then going to have another thousand-year reign of Christ who will rule with a rod of iron around the nations. And at the end of the period, the devil will be released for a brief period. And then out comes God who will oppress another rebellion and then eternity begins. The fun of us. Are you confused? I was when I read that. So do you, who could follow that, by the way, based off of their theology that they've... Who had, who, had, who had, maybe not that exact teaching, but who had elements of that teaching from their previous confessions? A couple of you? A couple elements of that teaching? I'd say it's a pop culture, though, too. A lot of it is pop culture. You know, the series only, but if you look at a lot of your horror and stuff, they break from that. So I think everyone's exposed to it. Yeah. I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't exposed to it, right? I was just in my own little bubble of orthodoxy, I guess. Yeah. Can you prove it's not true? <laughs> We're gonna ask me that question at the end. Tell me, let me see if I answer it. This is the point. How all of these things happen, when they happen, whether we are in the midst of the thousand year reign now or if it's going to come in the future, all of these teachings are all over the board. And what is worse is if I don't like what interpretation you have, I can make up my own and start my own church and you could pay me to tell you about it. Right? And that's what's happening. That is exactly what is happening. All of that being said, it is still okay for us as Orthodox Christians to read some of the images in the book and kind of be awed by them. Right? Because there was a reason that our Lord showed them to St. John. I pulled this quote. It's not in your books, but I did pull this quote from St. Dionysius. And he says this. This is St. Dionysius from Alexandria. It says, The darkness of this book of Revelation does not prevent one from being a... Did my, did my mic go out? No, I'm still in. Yeah, there's, there's oh. The darkness of this book does not prevent one from being astonished by it. What's more important than the details? The faith. My faith, which is more important than understanding. And this is shown to us by the fact that when you read books like this, this is a book by Archbishop of Virki, and it's about the epistles and the apocalypse. And he actually goes into detail, verse by verse, for those of you that are looking and want some information about some of those images, which we're not going to have. Is it out? I think it's something you're doing. I'm doing something. I think you're Oh, how about that? Better? Okay, we'll find out. What's that book again? This is, this is called The Epistles in the Apocalypse. This is actually pretty new by Archbishop of Verki. And what he does is he goes through all of the epistles, and more importantly for this class, he went through the Revelation. And he went through some of what the church fathers taught about what the various images they thought, and he uses that language in here. I think that this means this. And then he says, St. Andrew of Caesarea thinks this means this. But it's interesting that all of these fathers wrote that they think that some of the images, these images are different things. 
And there's all different types of interpretation of what the images are, but they didn't start their own church over it. They all remained in the church because the faith was more, the, the ultimate faith of what is to come is more important than the details, right? So there's something to be said about that. So these, these things are important. They could be good for us, but the faith is more important. Orthodoxy and your understanding of creation and what you were meant to do is more important. All right. So with all this confusion that's out there, how should we as Orthodox Christians approach the book of Revelation? Who said here that everybody's read the Chronicles of Narnia series? Most of you? Some of you? Who's read it from, from first book to last book? Long time, ago. Long time ago? Okay. Well, if you haven't, then think of another series for this, this another series of books that you might have read uh, in, in, in a row. Not the Left Behind series. Come on. <laughs> what were to happen... If we had never read any of the books of the Chronicles of Narnia, but we wanted to start with one that was in the middle, like Prince Caspian or the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Let's just say that we read the Voyage of the Dawn Treader without any of the other books. This is just the only book that we read, okay? We would read through this book and we would get an idea and understand the extent of that plot, the plot of the book, right? Because it's kind of a standalone story. We would understand who the characters are we could understand who some of the good guys and some of the bad guys are. But there are things in that book and relationships that were developed in other books that would go over our head completely, right? We would not grasp the full meaning of what was written or the full meaning of that book without reading the ones that came before it. Is that a fair mm -hmm. assumption to make? In the same sense, we cannot read the book of Revelation without knowing or understanding the rest of Holy Scripture. We have to look at the entire picture. So what are some of the things? Let's do this and let's, let's, let's test your knowledge of Scripture here for just a moment. What kind of things, so following in the, in the pattern of, uh, let's, let's look at this from the eyes of, of what we've been talking about, creation, okay? What do we learn in the Old Testament? What, is, what are some of the main themes of the Old Testament? Let's, let's ask the question that way. So I just blew one for you. So we learn about man's purpose in life and creation. What's something else that the Old Testament gives us, specifically in... The coming of okay, so prophecy. Yes, so the prophets. What did Moses give us? Laws. The laws, right? Mankind's tutor for understanding the depths of our spiritual needs, right? Creation taught us that we're broken, mankind's purpose in life. The law gave us this, you guys answered all of them, yes. The law gave us an understanding of our spiritual needs. The prophets pointed the way to Christ. What is the New Testament gospel about? Fulfillment. Fulfillment of the prophecy, the incarnation, and who said it? The crucifixion and the resurrection. The gospels are quite simply the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection with some extended introductions. That is what the, the New Testament Gospels are. Okay, very good. What would the epistles and revelations, what would the epistles and revelation be for us? What do they teach us? How to be a... Well, how to live the Christian life. How to be a Christian, right? How to be a Christian and how to prepare for what is to come. This is what the book of Revelation is for. How to prepare mankind for what is to come, not through fear or expectation, but through three things, readiness, preparedness, and watchfulness. And we see this play out actually in great Lent. Who has been through, all of you I hope by now have been through a complete Lenten cycle in the church. So on the very first day of great Lent, I'm really going to test your knowledge today, but you didn't know that this is going to be jeopardy today. On the first day of great Lent, we have what? Forgiveness. We have forgiveness vespers. But that entire weekend... What, is, what event does the church commemorate on that weekend before Great Lent starts? What major event in human history do we remember on that first day as we're preparing right to go into Great Lent, this great struggle to take us to the crucifixion? Adam's expulsion from paradise, right? His brokenness. We're reminded of our brokenness. The fact that even if we were in Adam's place because of our own pride and selfishness, we would have ate the apple too. Right? And then what services happen right after Forgiveness Sunday's over? We just realized Adam's expulsions of paradise. Bridegroom. No, Bridegroom is last week of Lent. The canon of St. Andrew of Crete, which goes through examples of all the Old Testament and the New Testament of just how far our souls have to go to reach their potential. So you see the pattern we're kind of following here, right? 
And then after the first week of Great Lent, we have what services on Wednesdays and Fridays? Presanctified Sanctified liturgies. liturgies. And we also, the church also calls, we don't do them so much in our parishes, but the monasteries have services every day. And they're reading constantly from the Old Testament. They're reading constantly from the Old Testament, giving us images, all leading up to what? What does Lent lead up to? Holy Friday, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Christ. And how long do we celebrate the New Testament, the, the, the Gospels, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ? How long do we celebrate? All week. Not just all week. For 40 days, right? 40 days and then an extra 10 that are kind of like half, half celebratory because of his ascension, right? And then what happens after that? The 50, so we, just, we, we celebrate and we remember Christ's resurrection, his redeeming, the, 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 the destroying of Hades and, and all of those wonderful themes that are surrounded for Pascha. And then what happens after that? Pentecost, Pentecost right? Yeah. The apostolic age yeah. where we're learning how to be Christians, right? What this, right? what this new life in Christ is meant to look like. So even in the yearly cycle of services, especially during Great Lent, we see this same pattern. Man's brokenness in the Old Testament, Christ's solution for us, his death or resurrection, and then the apostles teach us how to prepare for eternity, right? How to be Christians. So the main thing I wanted you to get from this slide is that we cannot read Revelation on its own without first understanding the rest of Scripture to put it in its proper context of how we're supposed to approach it. Which brings up that question. How should we approach Revelation. Why do you think the church didn't define? So we have all these church fathers that speak about these images and things like, you know, images and things that they think the images represent in the book of Revelation. Why do you think in an ecumenical council the church didn't get together and define the details and possible dates of the second coming of Christ? It's awful presumptuous. Huh? It's awful Let's say that Christ didn't say that sentence. What, what, what pract practical reason would we not do that? Oh, that's, he, says, he says for the camera, he says, you'll look like an idiot if you get it wrong. And, you know, that's how the Jehovah's Witnesses were started. <laughs> Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh Adventists. We're all started that way. There's more. There's more. What's the one from Parks and Recreation? It was a made-up religion. Anyway. <laughs> that Ron Swanson plays the flute. I don't know. Now that song's stuck in my head. You're laughing. You know what I'm talking about. Right. The simple answer is that understanding the details of the timing of the second coming was never the aim of the Bible. The timing of what is to come is something that we just don't need to know and it's not for our own good. Why would, why would knowing the timing of the second coming be bad for us spiritually? Procrastination. Huh? Procrastination, yeah, that could be bad, right? If we knew that the end of the world was next Wednesday, we would goof off for the five days and then the last day, I repent, right? I repent of everything that I did. I'm saved, right? It's the unknown, though, for us that always is supposed to cause us to be watchful and prepared. Well, the unknown is a very scary thing to think about. It is. But you should, and, but you should always, because you don't know, and forget about the second coming, you know, what about your own death? That's right. Could be tomorrow. It could be tomorrow, right? Meeting Jesus the conventional way. Huh? Meeting Jesus the conventional way. Meeting Jesus the conventional way, or the unconventional way, because death was never meant to be conventional. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to be normal, right? There's a beautiful, does anybody remember this? Were we all in the middle of that canon of St. Andrew of Crete? What do we do? The lights are out, the candles are lit. We're reading these beautiful verses that come from the, the all throughout Holy Scripture about our, what our lives are supposed to look like. And there's so many favorites of mine. But then what do we do? We all get down on our knees to hear this beautiful Kentucky and we're all kneeling and we all sing. The choir sings, my soul, my soul arise. Why are you sleeping? The end is drawing near. Awake then and be watchful that Christ our God may spare you who is everywhere present and fills, our thing, all, fills all things. So our calling is to always be prepared and watchful, not just for the second coming of Christ, but for, as we said, our own hour of death. And perhaps the parable that closely ties this of what our attitude needs to be towards the second coming is the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. When do we read this? Holy Week. Which day? Well, no. Which one do we specifically read about the five wise and the five foolish virgins? Tuesday. I think it's Monday. Monday. 
I was guessing myself. I'm pretty sure it's Monday. <laughs> Look in your books. I have this parable written out and I thought it'd be appropriate for us just to read through it really quickly. We remember what our Lord said. He said, The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go to meet him. And then all of the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and for you, but rather go, who, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who already went in with him at the wedding, and the door was shut. And afterward the other virgins came out also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So this reading is given to us, I believe, on Holy Monday, just a few days before the crucifixion of the resurrection. And it's a reminder to us that we always need to be ready. Ready. It doesn't matter when the bridegroom is coming. It doesn't matter how he's going to open the door. That's not the point. The point is to keep our wicks trimmed, and our lamps full of oil. What do the fathers say that that oil represents? Virtue. Nope. Virtue. Virtues. Yes, keep our life full of virtues and be ready to meet the bridegroom when he comes. But aren't the virtues the fruit of the Holy Spirit? <coughs> yeah, you could interpret it that way, I guess. I was trying to be specific on it, but... Think how detrimental it would be to our soul if we knew exactly when the second coming would be. We would be preparing out of fear, right? Somebody else said we'd be preparing out of fear instead of trying to grow with this hope and knowledge of the union with God. So that's very, very important. And speaking of fear, this is a perfect segue into perhaps what the main topic is for our evening's talk. And I'm going to seek to answer for you here as we wrap things up. What is heaven and what is hell? Because there are a lot of goofy ideas that we get from modern culture about what heaven and hell is. And for those of you that came from a different uh, Western, uh, Western, uh, Western leaning church, I think this, this is going to be mind blowing for some of you because it just, it's, it's completely the opposite of what you grew up with. I want to start before we go into this, our Chronicles of Narnia. The details surrounding exactly what heaven and subsequently hell is going to be like was never spoken with clarity by Christ or by the fathers and mothers of the church. What word does Christ use when he's describing parables that have to do with heaven and hell? <coughs> he says, the kingdom of heaven is like. like. Never says, this is what the kingdom of heaven exactly is going to be. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like. The details, the descriptions of what life is like in the kingdom are beyond our human understanding, similar to how that existence of being outside of time is beyond our comprehension. We simply have no way to describe this experience with 100% clarity because, quite frankly, we haven't experienced it yet, right? With one exception, which I'll share at the end. Should I move over? I was just pointing. Oh, you're a point, okay. So this brings us to perhaps one of my favorite parts of the entire Chronicles of Narnia series. This is C.S. Lewis's way of describing this incredible reality. So what I plan on doing here is we're going to read through this. It's a little bit long. And then I'm going to approach this with apophatic theology again and use some of these images to describe what heaven and hell are not. And then if you have any questions after that, I'll try to answer them as best as I can. So let's set the stage here for those of you that have not read this. So help set the scene. Before the last battle of Narnia, there were 11 dwarves that were, be, that were thrown into the shrine of Tosh. Okay? The shrine was actually this old stable where a race of men called the Cal... I always have... Calamines, is that how you would say that? I say Calamines. Calamines? Let's go with that. Where the race called the Calamines thought that their devil god Tosh was, high, was living in this old stable. And after the last battle of Narnia occurred between the Nardians and the Cal... Calarmenes, whatever. I'm going to have to say that like six times in this, so I better get pick something. 
the last king of Narnia, whose name was King Tyrion, ends up in the stable where he comes face to face with this devil god. And with great courage, he spoke the name of Aslan and Tosh disappeared. Do you remember this from the books? leaving King Tyrion alone in a very unusual place. And here's where we're going to pick that up. Tyrion had thought, or he would have thought, if he had time to think at all, that they were inside a little thatcheted stable, about 12 feet long and 6 feet wide. In reality, they stood on grass. The deep blue sky was overhead, and the air which blew gently on their faces was that of a day in early summer. So at this point, King Tyrion, just to skip ahead a couple paragraphs in the actual book, King Tyrion comes face to face with all of the other kings and queens of Narnia's long and rich history. And after some introductions, Queen Lucy and Tyrion notice the group of 11 dwarves who had been thrown into the old stable with him. And here's where we're going to pick up. Lucy led the way, and soon they could all see the dwarves. They all had a very odd look. They weren't strolling about or enjoying themselves, although the cords with which they were tied seemed to vanish. Nor were they lying down or having a rest. They were sitting very close together in a circle facing one another. They never looked around or took any notice of the humans until Lucy and Tyrion were almost near enough to touch them. Then the dwarves all cocked their heads as if they couldn't see anyone but were listening hard, trying to guess by what the sound of what was happening. Look out, said one of them in a surly, surly voice. Mind what you're, where you're going. Don't walk into our faces. All right, said Eustace indignantly. We're not blind. We have eyes in our heads. They must be darn good ones if you could see in here, said the same dwarf whose name was Diggle. In where, asked Edmund. Why, you bonehead in here, of course, said Diggle, in this pitch black, pokey, smelly little hole of a stable. Are you blind, said Tyrion. Ain't we all blind in the dark, said Diggle. But isn't it dark, you poor stupid fo But it isn't dark, you poor stupid dwarf, said Lucy. Can't you see? Look up. Look around. Can't you see the sky and the trees and the flowers? Can't you see me? How in the name of all humbug can I see what ain't there? And how can I see you any more than you could see me in this pitch darkness? But I can see you, said Lucy. I'll prove I could see you. You have a pipe in your mouth. Anyone that knows the smell of backy could tell you that, said Diggle. Oh, the poor things. This is dreadful, said Lucy. And then she had an idea. She stooped and picked up some wild violets. Listen, dwarf, she said, even if your eyes are wrong, perhaps your nose is all right. Can you smell that? And she leaned across and held the fresh, damp flowers under Diggle's ugly nose. But she had to jump back in order to avoid a blow from his little hard fist. None of that, he shouted. How dare you? Why do you what do you mean by shoving a lot of filthy stable litter in my face? There was a thistle in it, too. It's like your sauce. And who are you, anyway? Earthman, said Tyrion. She is Queen Lucy sent hither by Aslan out of the deep past, and it is for her sake that I, Tyrion, your lawful king, do not cut off all your head, do not cut all your heads from your shoulders, proved and twice proved traitors that you are. Well, if that doesn't beat everything, exclaimed Diggle, how can you go on talking about all that rot? Your wonderful lion didn't come to help you, did he? Thought not. And now, even now, when you have been beaten and shoved into this black hole, just the same as the rest of us, you're still at your old game, starting a new lie trying to make us believe we're none of us trying to make us believe we're none of us shut up and it ain't dark and heaven knows what there is no black hole save in your own fancy fool cried tyrion come out of it and leaning forward he caught diggle by the belt and hood and swung him right out of the circle of dwarfs but the moment tyrion put him down diggle darted back to his place among the others rubbing his nose and howling so eventually Aslan appears and the kings and queens of Narnia spoke to him about their sadness with what these dwarves were apparently experiencing and they asked Aslan what could be done for them. And Aslan raised his head and shook his mane and instantly a glorious feast appeared on the dwarves' knees. Pies and tongues and pigeons and trifles and ices and each dwarf had a goblet of good wine in his right hand but it wasn't much use. They began eating and drinking greedily enough but it was clear that they couldn't taste it properly. They thought they were eating and drinking only the sort of thing that you might find in a stable. One said he was eating hay, and another one said that he had a bite of an old turnip, and a third said he found raw, a raw cabbage leaf. And they raised golden goblets of rich red wine to their lips and said, Ugh, fancy drinking dirty water out of a trough that a donkey's been at. Never thought we'd come to this. 
But very soon, every dwarf, began, every dwarf began suspecting that every other dwarf had found something nicer than he had, and they started grabbing and snatching and went on to quarreling, till, a few minutes, till in a few minutes there was a free fight, and all the good food was smeared on their faces and clothes or trodden underfoot. But when at last they sat down to nurse their black eyes and their bleeding noses, they all said, well, at any rate, there's no humbug here. We haven't let anyone take us in. The dwarfs are still for the dwarfs. Pay attention to this line. I'm going to use it again here in a minute. You see, said Aslan, they will not let us help them. They have chosen cunning instead of belief. Their prison is in their own minds. Yet they are in that prison and so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. But come, children, I have other work to do. All right. So we're going to use some of these images that were in this reading and use the apophatic approach like I did with the book of Revelation to try and debunk some of the common misconceptions about hell. I will warn you that misconceptions number one and two are very similar. So before you ask questions on those, let me get through both of those first, okay? Misconception number one. <coughs> Excuse me. I should cover this mic so I can drink my... I didn't do that last week and I grossed myself out when I listened to how the audio sounded. <laughs> Misconception number one, hell is a place created by God for the express purpose of banishing the wicked forever to everlasting punishment. Whoever, who grew up with that type of theology? A lot of you. In the very first slide of the very first class, I told you all a story about a local pastor who asked a very polarizing question at a clergy breakfast, and he said, what is salvation? And to many Christians, this is a pretty universal question that's asked. But the answer, as we discovered in the first week, can be much different depending on how you approach the question. So it is, and you guys all raised your hand, it is common in Western thought, although certainly not all across the board, for salvation to be a deliverance from hell, right? We follow Christ's teachings in order to be saved from that place of eternal damnation. Is that fair? That makes there are some that, that that's fair. There's a typical non-Orthodox teaching that says that hell is a place created by God for the express purpose of banishing the wicked into everlasting punishment. And in this train of thought, the damned are spatially cut off from God, his kingdom, his people, and his love because they refuse to accept him in their life. But the Orthodox Christian understanding of salvation is not about getting to a place called heaven or hell. For us, it's not about something that's spatial. It's relational. I'm going to explain that in a second. So the goal of a Christian, at least from the Orthodox understanding, is not to get to a place called heaven. It's about growing in deeper communion with God by acquiring the Holy Spirit in this life and continuing it forever. Does everybody remember what the name of that process is from the first class? Starts with the TH? Theosis. Theosis. Growing in the image and likeness of God that was bestowed on all of us in the beginning. This is our goal. And this goes very quickly into misconception number two. Heaven and hell are two distinct realities. This is the misconception. However, as C.S. Lewis very beautifully put it in his description of the stable, heaven and hell are not two different, I'm doing this in quotations, places. We have this tendency to think because we read in books uh, and even we, we even see in scripture, what does Christ do when he ascends into heaven? Which, which direction does he go? Right. And then when we talk about Hades, which direction does, does he go? Down, right? We have this, this, this idea that heaven is up and hell is down by the magma with the fire, right? Now, when that's hell, is when, magma? No. <laughs> no. When in fact, heaven and hell are not places at all. And I'm sure some of you have heard this in the past. And I, this is, I, I hesitate to lose this because I use this, this sentence, but I'm going to just to try and explain it. Heaven and hell is not a place. It's a person. A what? Heaven and hell is not a place. It's a person. A simple orthodox understanding of heaven is a state of being where mankind comes face to face with God and is bathed and engulfed in the uncreated light of Christ. So when we're in God's presence, all of mankind, 
will be wrapped in the light of his divinity, his goodness. Remember we talked about that word goodness in the other classes and his glory. So for the Orthodox, there is no existence or place like hell. There is no place that is absent of the presence of God. He is everywhere present and fills all things. So then where do we get these ideas and all this talk about the damned being scorched with eternal fire? Here's the explanation for that. When mankind falls asleep in this world and comes face to face with Christ, he's going to be separated into two groups. For those that spent their lives preparing and living a life like Christ, they're going to experience the presence of God as bliss. Okay? But for those that had spent their days rejecting a life with Christ, they're going to experience that same light as a consuming fire. And this is why C.S. Lewis was quoted in his book, The Problem of Pain. He said, the gates of hell are locked from the inside. It's not God that sends you to hell. It's, it's your own reaction to his presence, which creates a hell for you. And the last battle, this, this big thing that we just read, gave us some really amazing imagery, right? The dwarfs and the kings and queens of Narnia were all standing in the presence of Aslan in paradise. And what did the dwarves experience that presence like? Darkness and hell, right? And what did the kings and queens see it as? Beautiful. Paradise. Unending paradise. And then Aslan said, they will not let us help them. The prison is in their own minds. Yet they are in that prison and so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. And you see this also, hold on one second, Dennis. You also see this imagery in the Old Testament a reading that we do on Holy Saturday about the three holy youths. Remember this? The three holy youths from the book of Daniel who refused to bow down to the idols of King Nebuchadnezzar. And what were they sentenced to? Fire. Fiery furnace, right? And the soldiers and those people that, that were with the king and hated what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego represented, they were all hatefully putting on the coals of the fire, right? And what was happening to them as they were adding to it? They were being what? They were being scorched, yes, from the flames that were coming out of the furnace. But when those three men were thrown into the exact same flames, they were walking in the fire with Christ in there with them. And what did they experience it as? A pleasant dew upon their faces, right? The same fire experienced in two distinct ways. So to sum this entire thing up about heaven and hell, Heaven and hell are not created places. In the end, we will all be living in the presence of God. And whether or not we enjoy it or experience as bliss or as a burn depends on the condition of our hearts. This is a, a very brief overview of the understanding. Yes, I knew there would be questions. Quick question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are converts and... We have talked to relatives and, well, you know, hearing them, and mm -hmm. they really liked the Orthodox understanding, what you're talking about. And then Tim got a book, I think it was called How Our Departed Ones Live, because, you know, they lost yes. a couple, you know, very close family members. And there was a lot of very vivid imagery, you know. <clears throat> things like, um, you know, the worm never dies. And uh, is that, can, can we then, if we have this understanding as Orthodox, can we take that to mean that it's just symbolic of like, say, like an inner gnawing that people will have that made the wrong choice? I can't speak to that because I've never read the context of those comments in that book, How the Departed Ones Live. I'll have to bring it and show it to you sometime. Because when, when Karen talked to me about it, she was upset. And I said, well, I'll have to talk to Father Gabriel because I don't really understand it either because I know what the Orthodox understanding is. Problem with, um, one of the problems with trying to come up with images of what this is like is none of the images that you're going to come up with your mind, in your mind are perfect, mm -hmm. right? They're not, they're, you're using material images to try and explain things that we can't explain. Yeah. The per, the, this is very general, right? We're not going into specifics, right? We're not going to say God is seven and a half feet tall sitting on the throne and shining with, with 
you know, a, a bright light that is just a little bit brighter than these lights. I mean, these aren't specifics and, and details because we can't know what that's like. Yeah. Right? She was, she was concerned because, as probably with all of us, there are people in the family who aren't believers. And it was very graphic. Yeah. Very graphic. You as have to far be. As what those people are going to experience. You have to be very careful when you read those books without this understanding first. Right? And in a lot of these things, you have to also read in mind, you have to read behind the words, behind the images. What are they trying to say? Right? They're not, because as soon as we start reading these, these, these things as, as solid images, we do the same thing that we do in the book of Revelation, right? Yeah. Oh, well, this means that the, the moon is actually going to turn red, and these, the, the meteors that are falling, from, the incense that came out of this golden censer and is falling to the sky is Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Like, we, we start to... If this is what our understanding is, what you've you know, just been teaching us, that when we read something like that, it is just... Don't take it as... Do, it is it's imagery. It's like an actual, you know... I mean, it sounds like in this book, like it's an actual worm. You know, a hideous worm or worms that's going to be feeding on people. There's also... So I just thought, oh. but, but there's also imagery from, from Orthodox writers about things like toll houses, right? Yeah. You hear about these, these, these different toll houses that don't even know the theology that well, but you stop at different places that, that, that there's certain different types of judgment and stuff like that. This is all speculative stuff. It's not, not hard, yeah. fast. This is, I mean, how, how could they know? Mm -hmm. How could they know? Well, right? I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that we, we, can, just, we can take it as imagery of what it's going to be like, <laughs> but that we aren't thinking that it's actual worms. You'll find, well, you'll find things all across the board. And you know, there's that other one that when, when we do the funeral service, hold on one second. When we do the funeral service, there's a line in there that I always wonder how, I, I always hesitate to say it, not because I don't agree with it, but there's a line in there that I know that everybody, when they hear that line, are going to be thinking something different than what the intent was. And it's, it's, let us stare into the graves. Man is naked bones, food for worms, and stench. Yeah. Only then can we understand the truth about comeliness and beauty, right? When you read that, you're like, oh, well, the Orthodox all think that men are just yeah. bones and worm food and stench. But the purpose behind that line is to show that, that until you understand the... Huh? Right. Right, but, but that, until you understand that, you know, and that's what the, the, the verse is saying, until you understand that, then you'll understand that the material world doesn't matter as much as what we're, we're striving for, right? So, but if you read it with just a, with, without that understanding, it sounds really morbid and exactly. gross and horrible. Well, you remember when you gave me that and you said, how would this be for when we were doing a service for press? Yeah. If I asked if we could leave that out. Right, right. Yeah, right. Because of how it's and because we weren't doing an Orthodox funeral service and just a couple psalms, we could we could yeah. adjust things like that. Yeah. But but for an Orthodox Christian, that would never be taken out of the right. funeral service. You know, just like when people say, "Can I have a closed casket because I don't feel comfortable with the open casket?" It's like, no, this is reality. This is half the services. And we'd go over the funeral service. Half the services for you to come to terms with this, right? It's not to close it and hide it and say, "Okay, it's not happening," right? So that's another example of that, though. Okay, thank you, Father. Sure. Um, Father, you, you, you stated that heaven and hell are in the same place, that there's no difference between the two because we're all in God, body, glory of God. Yes. But what about the devil and his angels? How Are they going to be involved the same way, or are they in a separate place? Well, why, can't, why does it have to be... You, have to, you also have to understand the word place. What is, when you say the word place, what are you talking about? I'm talking about, um, I guess we can call it the Abraham bosom between the two gods. Between so you're thinking, so you're using human images right. like place, things that you could step on, see, hear, feel, to describe something that we haven't experienced yet. That's the problem with, with some of these images that we see in scripture and, and these things like that. And this is why our Lord always says the kingdom of heaven is like and not is. Because we have to use, because otherwise we would not understand anything. We have to use imagery from our own concepts, right? From our own world. And he also says the kingdom of heaven is within, within you. you. Yeah, so what does that mean, right? 
how could, if the kingdom of heaven is within you, how could it be two separate places? Like heaven and hell. So it just, it, it, it's, it's, it's very hard to describe that without using human terms, which is why we say it's a mystery, right? Yes, it's a mystery. mystery. Perpetual? Well, as man, I've only lived maybe less than half a dozen. You said what? I'm sorry? I've been to less than a half a dozen people. Okay. And um, I've noticed that the Orthodox way you use makeup, um, they would be part of this like everybody else does. And I guess I, I want to know if that's something that you do or not because it kind of goes against what you were just saying and part of the prayer that is said. And I have wondered about this. Yes. So I... Uh, that is not a, like, you know, the, that's one of those things of economia, right? So she asked, the question was asked to repeat. She says, why do, in Orthodox funerals, why do I often see the body uh, make up and, you know, embalmed and everything like that? In the Orthodox tradition, that isn't done. That is not done. You are put on ice and then put really quickly in a very simple wooden casket. You do the service and then you're put into the ground. But there's this, it's, it's almost done out of, out of mercy for people that don't understand, in a sense, that, that it's, 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 it's a thing that is done out of economia. And we're at, why are we against that? Why do you think, just based off of these images, why, why do you think that that is not a normal, like you wouldn't see that in the old country, right? Why? This is a relatively new thing, dressing them up. And, huh? It's not a custom, it's, it's a very new custom if it is, because this idea of perpetual care and embalming and looking like we're still alive, this is within the past 100 years, maybe 110 years. And it's big business. And it's big business in America too, yeah. But, but the, why? Why would, we not, why would we be against that? Why would you want to be made to look like you're alive? You're not. Could, could we ask to not have makeup? Yeah, absolutely. You know, most priests are not buried with, with there's no makeup for most priests, and, and, and monastics, they're not buried with makeup. They're taken from the, faces are well, some of them are, some of them are, you know, monastics' faces are covered, right? But those, they're just put, they're taken from their cells and put into a, a wooden box. Some of them die in their boxes because they know that their time is near, and they're like, okay, I'm going to sleep now to, to, to be with my Lord. And they go into the, they, they die in their caskets, ready to go. And the funeral's done within 24 hours. Right. Another thing that embalming, and this is, uh, you know, you have to remember too that most of these families in the old country and the Orthodox countries, they were all from the same village, so it was very easy to get everybody together. But now there are laws that say that if your funeral is going to be delayed for four or five days, you have to do these things, so that you know. So there's there's some there's some other considerations too of why we do that. They didn't have the embalming in the old countries. I mean, they no, they put them on ice. Yeah, they. Uh, but anyway, we have a class on the funeral and death that comes up every year, so I, I don't want to take away from the, this idea of heaven and hell. But those were good questions. Any other questions about heaven and hell before I get to my last point? Yes, Kurt. There's been so many people since the beginning of time that haven't had the opportunity to know Christ because of when they lived on this earth or the places on this earth that they lived. Yes. Or the circumstances like Abortion. So, without the opportunity of theosis, what happens to them? What happens to them? God is merciful. The presence of God doesn't change. The presence of God doesn't change. How they experience that? There's different fathers that will will say different things. I mean, there's you will, you'll be hard pressed to find an Orthodox father. At least a lot of them. There's not a consensus that says that, like some churches, well, they're going to hell because they weren't baptized, or they're going to experience Christ as a consuming fire because they weren't baptized. You won't find that in the Orthodox Church. It's very much a, a mystery. They were also sinless, right? They didn't turn their, their back on anything. So when you understand it, it's actually, a, it, this is one of the draws of Orthodoxy in this understanding of heaven and hell, is that when you understand it like this, it makes those questions and those, those difficult questions that are gnawing at us a little bit easier to to take in, you know. Um, that one in, in that last book of um, Narnia, mm -hmm. um, that one, Colt Fullerman? Okay. Uh, Col Callerman, Callerman, uh, whatever, <laughs> Callerman. He's, he went in looking for Tash, but he had a good heart, so he was 
So then he found Ash Ashlyn. You mean King Tyrion went in? No, no in the, the book there's a, there is a, a Calabine who is... Uh, oh, before him. His idea of who Tash is, he believes that Tash is all the things that we would believe, that the Narnians would believe about Aslan, that he is good and true and loving and merciful, and he's doing all these things. And in the book, they say essentially um, everything that he did, that he intended to do in the service of Tash was really done in service of Aslan. And that Aslan can see, he knows who his worshippers are. I completely so missed was, that. So he was wow. a good man, and instead of going with the bad, uh, the demon, he went with Aslan. That's a, but he didn't believe in Aslan, he believed in the other guy. <laughs> that's a beautiful image. See, I missed that one when we were, when we were doing that. You know, there's another thing, too, is, is you said, like, what about that poor kid in, in, in the middle of the ISIS-controlled territories that grew up and never heard the name of Christ or anything like that? When he gets in front of God, how is he going to experience Did he live his life in such a way that he could accept something like that? No. You know, well, who knows? That, accept God? You know, we don't know. Isn't there something in Romans 1 that kind of touches on this? About conscience. Isn't the, it Paul and the Areopagus talking about eternity in their hearts? There are people who never knew the law, but they followed it to the best of their ability, and so they have eternity in their hearts. I'd have to go back and look. I'd have to I'd, I, before answering. Stamp on us whether we. Oh, who said that? Well, we all have the image and likeness of God within us. Yes, and and then whether they actually so if they had never heard about God. They would still have that image. But see, you, you see all these speculative things? We're starting to go down the rabbit hole of, of yeah. well, well th what about this and what about this? A lot of it is we've, we've got to accept that God has the best intention for all of us, right? Yeah. I mean, we do have to have a, a response to it as best as we can. But he is, it, the, the big thing is, is that he's not going to say, you didn't say my name during, during your life. You're destined for hell, right? It's, it's, it's our response to his presence. This is right. the this is the reverse. It's not a, a it's not it's not a a court seat, right? Where he says, "You never said my name once in your entire life. You're going to hell." It's it's our 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 response to to the light that is shining off of him. Like it says in Samuel, he looks at the heart. He looks at our heart. And there was another verse I should have written it down in, from Sirach, from the wisdom of Sirach too, that had a very beautiful similar to that. But yes, David. It's not so much a question as much as a comment, but I think that well, when I went to the Wind and Night of Hope with everyone, I received a little pocket Bible from one of the street preachers, and in the back there's a step-by-step -step way of getting saved. And of course in the Orthodox Church we don't have that, right? Right. And I think we should all be so worried about our own self, not worried, but so concerned about our own salvation that we're not even, I don't even think it makes sense to think about where other people are going. We can speculate about it, but I feel like that's not, that's in the prerogative of God. And we don't believe in this Western concept. And I know it's a generalization. Not all people believe this, but in the sense that God is, oh, he's vindictive and he's like a medieval, um, you know, thief who's, you know, like angry at all his, you know, subjects. Right. Demands, you know, retribution and for all of these things. Well, I don't, that's not the way we look at God, I feel like, and that's not, you know, we rely, like someone else mentioned, on the mercy of God. We, everything else we just throw onto that, and we can't know for sure. That's yeah. my yeah. perspective. Amen. Amen. One more, well, let me take one more question or comment, and then, because I, I have one more misconception I have to get through, and it's probably the most important one of all. So. It's, a, it's above our pay grade. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. And I think it was Twilight Zone that did one on that aspect of the mission. And we said, we're coming to that in a couple of weeks. This must be it. Oh, yes. Because there, what it was was like a living room, and there was an old gentleman there reading, and a, an old lady doing some knitting or crocheting or something, and then it comes. John asked him, I think, the name of uh, Gomez from the. Yeah. <laughs> and he's a hippie. This was like in the 60s, early 60s. And uh, he's paid Sp back Speak up so they can hear you in the mic. Oh, He's passing, you know, back and forth through there. It's like, what's going on? Where did you go? You know, the other thing, like, the keeper that came in to the room, he goes, hey, well, you know, when he thought he was going to go to hell because he's a bad person, you know. And um, he goes, what am I going to go? You know, to hell. And 
out here because these, these guys are driving me nuts, you know. And every time he throws something down, he pick it up and do it. And he goes, you know, I'm mad. Yeah. So for what for those it was heaven. And for he was a hell. There's a lot of pop, so just as much as there's pop culture references to the opposite of what we believe, there's also probably some pop culture references to a more orthodox understanding of these. Let me get to the last misconception, because this one, remember I told you, I'm going to explain now why I anointed all of you with the oil that we, we had before. Misconception number three, we have to wait until death or the second coming to experience heaven. You know, we hear this phrase in the funeral service for a loved one, and I know that I've said this, and I'm sure many of, the other, many of you have said this phrase as well over a lifetime. Well, John Smith has gone to a better place. Have we used this, this terminology before. In essence, what we're saying is that this person is now with God, and it's better, the experience that he is having is better than anything we could possibly have on earth. But the orthodox understanding of heaven and hell kind of refutes this language. Heaven for us is a state of the human soul which is dependent on what our own individual response is to God's love. Well, if God is here among us right now and not just sitting in a throne waiting for us to, waiting for our soul to leave our bodies and to experience Him, why can't we experience a foretaste of heaven right now? Right? Living our lives in complete communion with God, experience that same light that shines on those who had fallen asleep in the world. We can have this right now. Right now. And there's a beautiful story, and we're not going to read the whole thing because we'll be here all night. But when you take these, please take these books home with you. And there is a beautiful story at the end of these books of Saint Seraphim of Seraph, who was a Russian monk of the 19th century who went into the forest with one of his spiritual children, Motovilov, during a snowstorm. And Motovilov, in what is this famous modern writing of the church, explains how he witnessed Saint Seraphim becoming um, almost transparent in appearance while emitting what was for Motovilov a blinding light. And he described how he had felt in the middle of the, in the, middle of the snow this warmth in the middle of the Russian winter along with this beautiful fragrance and this unspeakable joy and peace. And there's no page numbers, but can anybody, can everybody turn really quickly to, I think it's five pages from the end, it's got a picture of St. Seraphim of Seraph that looks like this. Can everybody turn to that page? Page it, It's, I'm sorry, yeah, it's the Theosis experience shining with the light of Tabor, it's the next page. Tell me when you're there, real quick. It's, it's, it's on a, it's got an icon of St. Seraphim kind of shining. Okay? Everybody got this? Does anybody need a book to follow along? Anybody? Got this? It's got a picture of St. Seraphim the Seraph on it. Yep, that one right there, Sue. Yep, that one. I'm sorry I didn't put page numbers on this. Okay. Let's, let's start on the third paragraph there, and I just want to read just a few paragraphs because and I really want you to take this in. And by the way, Whenever he's referring, he'll say, my godly, he'll, he'll, he'll call Motavilov, I think, uh, uh, how does he describe him? Uh, your godliness, right? He's, 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 he's describing him as, as your godliness, okay? That's, that's his adjective for Motavilov. His father Seraphim replied, I have already told you your godliness, that it is very simple, and I have related in detail how people come to be in the spirit of God and how we could recognize his presence in us. So what do you want, my son? I want to understand it well, I said. Then Father Seraphim took me firmly by the shoulders and said, We are both in the Spirit of God now, my son. Why don't you look at me? I replied, I cannot look, Father, because your eyes are flashing like lightning. Your face has become brighter than the sun, and my eyes ache with pain. Father Seraphim said, Don't be alarmed, your godliness. Now you have yourself become as bright as I am. You are now in the fullness of the Spirit of God yourself. Otherwise, you would not be able to see me as I am. Then bending, on, then bending his head towards me, he whispered softly in my ear, Thank the Lord God for his unutterable mercy towards us. You saw that I did not even cross myself, and only in my heart I prayed mentally to the Lord God and said within myself, Lord, grant him to see clearly with his bodily eyes that descent of thy spirit, which thou grantest thy servant when thou art pleased to appear in the light of thy magnificent glory. And you see, my son, the Lord instantly fulfilled the humble prayer of poor Seraphim. 
How then shall we not thank him for this unspeakable gift to us both? Even to the greatest hermits, my son, the Lord God does not always show his mercy in this way. This grace of God, like a loving mother, has been pleased to comfort your contrite heart at the intercession of the mother of God herself. But why, my son, do you not look at me, look me in the eyes? Just look and do not be afraid. The Lord is with us. And after these words, I glanced at his fate and face, and there came over me an even greater reverent awe. Imagine in the center of the sun, in the dazzling light of its mid midday rays, the face of the man talking to you. You see the movement of his lips and the changing expression of his eyes. You hear his voice. You feel someone holding your shoulders, yet you do not see his hands. You do not even see yourself or his figure, but only a blinding light spreading far around for several yards and illumining with its glaring sheen both the snow blanket which covered the forest glade and the snowflakes which besprinkled me and the great elder. You can imagine what state I was in. How do you feel now, Father Seraphim asked me. Extraordinarily well, I said. But in what way? How exactly do you feel well? I answered, I feel such calmness and peace in my soul and no words can express it. This, your godliness, said Father Seraphim, is the peace of which the Lord said to his disciples, My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. If you were in the world, the world would love its own. But because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But be of good cheer, I am overcome, to the, I am overcome the world. And to those people whom the world hates, but who are chosen by the Lord, the Lord gives that peace which you now feel within you, the peace which, in the words of the Apostle, passes all understanding. The Apostle describes it in this way, because it is impossible to express in words the spiritual well-being which it, which it produces in those whose hearts the Lord God has infused it. Christ the Savior calls it a peace which comes from His own generosity and is not of this world. For no temporary earthly prosperity can give it to the human heart. It is granted from on high by the Lord God Himself and this is why it is called the peace of God. What else do you feel? Father Seraphim asked me. An extraordinary sweetness, I replied. And he continued, This is the sweetness of which it is said in Holy Scripture, They will be inebriated with the fatness of thy house and thou shalt make the drink of thy torrent of thy delight. And now this sweetness is flooding our hearts and coursing through our veins with unutterable delight. From this sweetness our heart melts as it were, and both of us are filled with such happiness as tongue cannot tell. What else do you feel? An extraordinary joy in my heart. And Father Seraphim continued, When the Spirit of God comes down to man and overshadows him with the fullness of his, of his inspiration, then the human soul overflows with unspeakable joy, for the Spirit of God fills with joy whatever it touches. This is the joy of which the Lord speaks in His Gospel. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more of the anguish for joy that a man has brought into this world. And I want to skip down a little bit for interest of time here. Skip down to the middle. He says, What else do you feel, your godliness? I answered, An extraordinary warmth. How do you feel warmth, my son? Look, we are sitting in the forest in the winter outdoors and snow is underfoot. There is more than an inch of snow on us and the snowflakes are still falling. What warmth can there be? I answered, such as there is in a bathhouse when the water is poured from the stone and the steam rises in clouds. And the smell, he asked me, is it the same as a bathhouse? No, there is nothing on earth like this fragrance. When in, my daughter, when in my dear mother's lifetime I was fond of dancing and used to go to balls and parties, my mother would sprinkle me with scent which she brought, bought at the best shops in Kazan. But those scents did not exhale such fragrance. And you could read the rest for yourself. It's a very powerful book. But some people might read this and they would see an exaggeration, right? A myth, a fairy tale. But we see... And we hear and we experience things like this in orthodoxy all the time. You all witnessed the weeping icon. That fragrance he was talking about is on your forehead when I anointed you upstairs, right? And how many of you, when you visited or saw that icon, and I saw many of you do this, when it was first brought into the church, how many people were brought to tears just at the presence of what walked through the door. The presence of holiness, the presence of God. Uh, our treasurer, I hope I'm not, not outing him here, but he said to me, 
I think I mentioned it one time. He said, you know, and he wasn't the only person that weekend to tell me this. He says, you know, with all the stuff that goes on in our life, for just the, the couple hours that I was in the church, everything <coughs> felt right. Right? Everything felt right. Manuela, same thing. Right? Everything felt right. And she would ask me too, speaking of Manuela, she would ask me, she would say, uh, she would ask me questions like, what would heaven be like? And then I would anoint her and I'd be like, I could tell you what it smells like. Right? Being in the presence of that fragrance. Do you still got that? The oil? The yes. The Upstairs, yes. I could anoint anybody that was not there for Compline, I could anoint you before you go. The best way to describe this for us and kind of close our course for tonight is how we hear of this kind of grace and bliss described in the last battle. The kings and queens of Narnia all found themselves at a beautiful tree in paradise that had some incredible looking fruit, all of which they decided, okay, I feel that the time is right. It's okay for us to eat this, not like back in the other book, right? And I picked this particular section because it gives us a real, a small taste, literally a taste, of how standing in the light of Christ, participating in his glory, and reaching that state of theosis would put all other earthly scents and pleasures to shame. So go back to your, the last page of the, the, before that article. And this is, as, this is what, what C.S. Lewis describes what the fruit tasted like. He said, what was the fruit like? Unfortunately, no one can describe a taste. All I could say is that compared with those fruits, the freshest grapefruit you'd ever eaten was dull, the juiciest orange was dry, and the most melting pear was hard and woody, and the sweet, sweetest wild strawberry was sour. And there were no seeds or stones or wasps. If you had once eaten that fruit, all of the nicest things in this world would taste like medicines after it. But I can't describe it. You'll have to find out what it is like. You, you can't find out what it is like until you get to that country and taste it for yourself. Eternal union with God, that's the destiny of mankind. This is heaven. This is the mark. So as we approach the last class here with Bishop Alexander, let's all strive to keep yearning for that grace that he freely gives to all those who are yearning for him. Amen. Amen. And please do take those things home with you that, uh, and, and read it. And that, that, that article, it's very long, and he does talk a lot about the Holy Spirit, and it is a little bit hard to read. But just like C.S. Lewis in his... Um, you know, if anybody's ever read, and you should read, because we're coming up to the, the Christmas fast, the, on the Incarnation, there's a beautiful foreword that C.S. Lewis wrote about St. Athanasius' On the Incarnation, where he says that even though this is real heady stuff, you should still read it. And if you don't understand a paragraph, or it just goes like this, don't, don't do it all in one sitting. Just maybe pick four paragraphs a day, and just read through it, and then if you don't understand it, read it again until you at least get a grasp of what he is trying to, to express what Father Seraphim is trying to express. And we have a beautiful, uh, we will have the presence of, of, not in a relic, but we will have the presence of uh, Father Seraphim, uh, Saint Seraphim with us as uh, Eliana took the name Seraphima after Saint Seraphim of Seraph. So when she's baptized on Sunday, you'll hear uh, her patron, patron saint will be uh, Saint Seraphim of Seraph, who was the one that wrote that, that beautiful article. So you'll all have a nice presence with him on that day. So any final questions before we do our prayer? If we have any individual questions, I guess you could stay after and ask me, but please do stick around so we can get the, the tables. Boy, do we have anybody with a truck here today? Anybody bring a truck? Your Yukon? It'd be great if we could pull that down here and then take these tables back over to the annex. If like t three or four guys can stay and do that, that'd be really great. And I could set them up later. I just need to get them over there. So any questions for me? Was this helpful? Hopefully something different. Good. Well, my time with you is over. Bishop Alexander's time for you is just beginning. So he's going to talk next week about the last judgment. Um, and uh, we're going to begin that again next week with a Maleben of Thanksgiving for paying off the mortgage at 6 p.m. He's going to serve that. And then at 6.30, he'll have his talk. And then weather permitting, we'll go outside. We'll have the bonfire. Uh, and we'll have um, refreshments for everybody down here as we kind of celebrate this milestone in our parish. If it's raining like it is today, uh, we'll still have refreshments down here and celebrate. We just won't be, we'll have to stick a, we'll have to put it over the oven or something, <laughs> like over the flame, unless it's an electric oven. So. All right, thank you, everybody. Let's do our prayer. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It is truly me to bless you, O Theotokos, ever Virgin Mary, and the Mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without defilement, you gave birth to God the word, truth, Theotokos, we magnify you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory Thank you, everybody. Thank you.